So, uh, hi. Uh, my name is Vivek. I work for uh, Collabora. You've probably seen a couple of my colleagues talk here already before. And today I'm going to talk about uh, something that may not mean very much to you, which I'm calling segregated dynamic linking, uh, because naming things is hard, and this will do until somebody comes up with something better. Um, OK, so let's jump into it. Um, what is it? Um, you may be wondering. So let's start with a statement of the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, these days, a lot of applications are containerized. I'm using that term kind of loosely. They're in some kind of um, wrapper. They have uh, libraries that come with them. Um, the libraries come from the runtime rather than from the host. It's just a way of improving portability and stability because you know we all know, you know most people here know about the kind of portability problems we have. Well, that's kind of mostly true. It's a little bit of a lie. Um, some of them still need to come from the host, um, notably your graphics stuff. It's quite closely tied to the hardware. There's no reasonable way of shipping it in a given runtime and still having it work with whatever hardware you end up having to work with. Um, which is all fine for the most part. You know, you can sort of do that. But then you have the problem which we were trying to solve in the first place with our containerized applications, which is that the host and runtime libraries may be incompatible. Um, this is kind of a really very primitive sketch of what the problem might look like. You can see that uh, we've got a dependency down there, and we've got something in the runtime that uses it. The main executable uses it. And unfortunately, we also need to have this library from the host, probably libgl or something similar. It's incompatible. Um, it's not going to run. Uh, everyone's really unhappy because we haven't solved the problem that we set out to solve. Um, so what could a solution look like? Uh, well. We kind of want to have segregated linking. Uh, we want the host library that needs its compatible version or incompatible version of the library linked to it, but we want the rest of everything else not to see that. You know, we, we want to be generally unaware that there's another incompatible version of this dependency over here. Um, and for those of you who um, are familiar with how linking works, how many people is that, by the way, just so I know? how many people I'm lying to. Well, that's a fair few, OK. So if you spot me telling any lies, don't, don't tell anyone else. Let's keep the illusion of competence alive. Um, so uh, you'll know that this isn't how linking on ELF works. I mean, there are other systems which, in which the link is a tree, and that has its own problems. But in general, we have one copy of a library, and everything uses it, which is kind of the problem that shared libraries set out to solve in the first place. Uh, so. Uh, what are our objectives here? Um, we want to expose only the library that, that we, we are pulling in. So um, we want to expose libhost, but we don't want to expose this copy here, which is incompatible. Um, it, it, as it's a dependency, it's the thing we're trying to protect ourselves from. We don't want to see it. We don't want to have to change the code, because uh, if we had to change the code of our application or our libraries, that would kind of defeat the point. You know. We, we could say to people, hey, you're going to have to rewrite your programs to make them all portable. Well, that's been tried several times. We all know how that goes. It doesn't happen. Uh, we don't want to have to recompile the applications. Again, same thing. Um, it's just going to be nonsensical if we say, and now you have to rebuild whatever the large application is that you wanted to run. And we would very much like for there to be no performance hit. So, um, and we also want it to be transparent. You know, it should happen um, when someone loads their containerized application or game or whatever. Um, it should happen pretty much transparently. The user should not know anything is happening here. And just to make life easy for ourselves, we want this to be done with minimal manual intervention. You know, like we want this to be as frictionless as possible, because any time you put a barrier in an application developer's way, they won't do it with reason. You know, we're, we're asking them to do something, and they should say, well, I shouldn't have to worry about this. It's not my problem. It's yours. Um, so uh, well, let's uh, go through this, and we'll see how many of these we can achieve. Um, so what are the pieces of the puzzle that we're going to need for this? Uh, first of all, private dependencies. Uh, a library should have isolated dependencies. Uh, normally, there's a single linked list, effectively, of the dependencies in your, in your program space. Um, everything will come from there. You'll get anything that you mention the name of as, as your dependency. You will see symbols from that. And it's just one flat list. There's no uh, segregation going on there. So we need to kind of defeat that somehow. 
Worst case scenario, we're going to have to rewrite the linker. I really, really don't want to do that, so let's hope I don't have to. Um, and the answer turns out to be DLM open. So this is a new library call that was introduced in glibc in around, I want to say 2.19, I think. It, was sort of, it sort of existed before then, but that's sort of the first version that works without immediately exploding in most cases. Um, uh, it's, it's not quite there yet. It's a work in progress. Um, patches are still being fed upstream. But from then, from then on, it kind of works. And what does it do? Um, it is like DL open. It adds a library after you've loaded up to your link map. But it can also create a new secondary or tertiary link map and add libraries to that instead. Which sounds kind of promising. It's, it's basically what we ordered for this. Um, and just like DL open, it automatically loads dependencies. So we have a problem in that we want to pick the right libraries. Like if you remember from back, we had two copies of the dependency. We want to be able to pick the right one. Now, by default, it's going to go to your standard loading path, and it's going to load the one that's coming from your runtime and your container with your containerized application. Um, see, libraries are picked from the search path. We kind of need to defeat that um, because we will still get the wrong copy for at least one side of our link chain if if we just let it do its thing. Um, so we want isolated libraries to come from the non-standard search path. We must divert searches for dependencies of isolated libraries. Can we do that? Um, yeah, sort of. The linker loads all listed dependencies, um, but it won't reload items that are already in the link map it's targeting. So if the library is already there, it looks at your dependencies and said, you asked for libfoo. I have something called libfoo. My work here is done, moving on to the next one. So if we load the libraries for the isolated library by their full path, not just by their SO name, not just by libfoo.so, uh, we can say, you know, run host, whatever, wherever we've exposed the host libraries. We do them in reverse dependency order. So we walk the dependencies backwards. We say, oh, libhost needs libdep. I will go and get that from wherever I've mapped in the host libraries. Um, then by the time the linker gets to it, it won't go and search the standard search path. It'll look in the link map that it's loading to, and it'll say, I already have that. My work here is done. I'll get my symbols for you from here. We can move on. So um, yeah, we, we can do it. We can get what we wanted. Um, well, sort of. We, we, we're partway there. We've gotten partway there. We haven't had to rewrite the linker, which is always a plus in my book. Um, but what we've achieved is we've isolated the DLM open symbols completely. They're not available by default to anything, so we still haven't met our goal of all of this being frictionless and seamless. So we need a caller of our uh, library that's coming from the host to get those symbols automatically. Um, and in order to do that, we need to understand how dynamic library calls work. So we're going to do a little bit of a dive into that. Now, don't worry about it, because we're going to go into some detail but at the end of it, what we will have figured out is that we don't actually need to know any of that detail because it sort of works the way we, we need it to, um, which is always nice. So this is what jumping to a foreign function call, a, a call from another ELF object, a library in this case, uh, looks like. Uh, we start by pushing our arguments for the call onto the stack. And then we look into something called the procedure linkage table. So each foreign function that you have has an entry in the procedure linkage table. And we look up its address. We read it back from something called a relocation record. Um, and the things that are important to note here are the red and yellow sections are read-only. They can't be touched once they've been loaded. It's only the, it's only the blue columns, the stack and the RR, that are written to. Um, everything else is read-only, which sort of brings us some nice features of shared libraries. Um, for example, they can be shared in between processes um, uh, without any problems. Um, so this is the first step of calling a function. So we've got an address from the relocation record. And then what happens is that uh, the first time you call a function, you don't actually get the address of the function. You get something called the fix-up code. Um, the so the fix-up code pointed by the relocation record asks the linker for the real address. The linker searches the, call, uh, the dependencies of the calling object for sort of where it should look for the symbol. And then it writes that address back into the relocation record. 
So this, this chunk here in green, so this is this blue, this happens every time you call a foreign function. This happens only the first time you call it. And then, this happens every other time. We re we've read the record back from the relocation record. We jump to the text. Uh, the function does whatever it needs to do, um, whatever it was written to do. Uh, the return value is pushed onto the stack, and then we jump back to the caller. Uh, so if we scribble on that relocation record before this first call ever happens, the PLT fix-up will never be invoked, so we sort of bypass the normal symbol resolution entirely. It's up to us where this goes. Um, the linker never resolves the symbol address. We have total control over where the function call goes. This is sort of the thing that a lot of people writing malware use to redirect your functions. Um, uh, thing is, they have a rather nice feature in that they, need to only, they only need to work about maybe one time out of a million, and they've got a successful attack. We need this to work every time, you know, which kind of makes things harder for us. You know, they're amateurs, basically. Um, the, this is an important bit. At no point did we need to know the signature of the function we were calling. The caller puts the arguments onto the stack in the expected way. That was handled by the compiler because it had the signatures when the program was compiled. The callee pulled the arguments off the stack. It knew what it was expecting. But even though we're diverting the call to a completely different location, we didn't actually need to know the details. It was taken over just before and just after we did anything. So we didn't need to know that, which is good, because it makes it much easier for us to automate this whole process. There's a huge amount less that we need to know. We don't need to know the arguments. We don't need to know how they are laid out on the stack. All we need to, all we need to know, which is guaranteed for us, is that they are there on the stack when the call happens. So the key question is, can we find that relocation record and scribble on it reliably? And the answer, luckily for me, again, no need to rewrite the linker, is yes, we can. The link map entry has a pointer to the elf data for each library, and libelf can interrogate this. So we've added one dependency, libelf, but I'm pretty sure that's not going to change incompatibly anytime soon. Um, so great, we can now put these pieces together. We can make a shim library with the target library's SO name so that the linker, when the linker loads it, um, and we put it on the search path. So, for example, if I want to load libgl, there's no actual libgl inside my runtime inside with my containerized application, but I can put a shim libgl there, um, which will be loaded by the linker. And during the init phase of that shim library, I can DLM open the real library and all its dependencies in reverse order, as I've said. Um, uh, I can search the alternate library path to do it, so I know I'm getting the host one because I want the one that didn't come with dependencies that didn't come with my runtime. Uh, and then I walk the link map. I'm, I'm making this sentence do a lot of work here. I walk the link map and scribble on all the relevant relocation records so that um, all of the functions in my binary, instead of going to the PLT fix up and then finding the location of the stub function in my shim library, they'll actually go to the real one. They don't ever realize they've been diverted because I've bypassed the normal symbol lookup code. Um, so yeah, kind of we can basically do this. Now obviously I've simplified a lot. Uh, there are some details and some problems. Um, uh, the self-shaving yak has not yet been invented. Um, so I'm just going to establish a couple of term, terms up front. I've called an isolated set of libraries a capsule. Um, there may be a better name. Naming things is hard. Uh, if you can think of a better name, by all means, let me know. Um, and then I've assumed that they come from a file system mounted at slash host. So within my chroot or container or runtime or bubble wrapped environment or whatever, I have mapped in the actual host file system read only at slash host. Um, for example, it could actually be anywhere. Um, other problems, DL open can't be called from inside a DLM open namespace. It causes the C library to explode, which is not fun for anyone. Uh, so I need to use this relocation record scribbling mechanism, which I've already established, to replace the DL open inside a capsule with a wrapper that does the following. It calls DLM open instead of DL open. It does the path remapping and symlink resolution relative to slash host or wherever I've told it the extra li the, the foreign libraries are located. And it doesn't accept RTLD global because DLM open um, 
doesn't yet have semantics for that. I'm discussing that with glibc upstream. Uh, when we've hashed that out, it will, but for the time being, I need to mask that. Uh, uh, the reason I need to mask that is because um, libgl does the, um, it, it DL opens itself RTLD global to expose symbols to its plugins, which was fun in games when I figured it out, but uh, uh, until I did was uh, a, a puzzling crash as far as I was concerned. Uh, what else? Okay, DL sim, which is how you get symbols from a DL open library, now has to uh, have a split personality. It needs a little bit of extra work. Remember, we want this all to be seamless, but now there are two namespaces, not one, and that means that when something in our application calls DL sim, I need to transparently go, ah, uh, you may have meant this namespace over here and look in there, but I only want it to find the symbols of the directly targeted library. I don't want to look at any dependencies, so I need to be quite careful. So again, similarly, I will scribble on the relocation record for DLSIM and replace it with a wrapper that does these kind of safety checks for me. Um, another interesting thing, so the, the, the usage of libgl, which was the primary use case, um, uh, varies quite a lot. Some things link statically against it, some things uh, DL open libgl. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways you can use it. So anytime another library that's not necessarily one that I've exposed is DL opened, I need to scribble on its relocation records as well, which means that I similarly have to wrap DL, o DL open outside the capsule in, a, you know, in the same way so that anytime something is DL opened, I scribble on its relocation records. So if it needs uh, for example, a libgl function, it gets the right one. Uh, extra problems. Currently, each uh, this is kind of a lie in my demo because this is fixed, but the patches have not yet been reviewed and accepted upstream. So currently, each namespace has its own glibc copy, which works a lot better than you might think in that it actually works at all. Um, but it does make anything to do with threads quite... It's not actually a deadlock, but it looks like a deadlock. Uh, deadlock prone. Um, alloc and free is interesting, of course. As long as all of your allocation uh, freeing of a particular pointer happens on the same side of the capsule boundary, you're okay. It, it works. It's fine. If you pass a pointer to across the boundary and expect it to be freed on the other side and you've got two glibcs, uh, then, yeah, glibc immediately throws a hissy fit and says, what are you asking to me, to me to free? I've never seen that pointer in my life. Corruption, pull the ripcord, bail out immediately. Uh, we have a disaster on our hands. So, yeah, there is going to be an extra flag called RTLD shared, uh, which is currently being reviewed. And what that will do is allow me to put sort of the fundamental libraries like the glibc cluster have the same instance on both sides. Um, it's building on work that's there in, in, in glibc anyway, because as you can imagine, there can only be one copy of the loader. So it, it sort of half already does this, but it needs to know to do it uh, for glibc as well. And that's kind of one of the things that I'm uh, feeding upstream. Uh, so the workaround I had before was to replace the alloc and free clusters inside the capsule, um, uh, which kind of in a hackish sort of way tried to dispatch the uh, pointers to the right place to be freed. It, it doesn't really come up much when using libgl because libgl doesn't really allow allocation to pass across the boundary, its API, but for other libraries, it, it might be relevant. Uh, right, so, and finally, does it actually work? I'm gonna, uh, hostage to fortune here, I'm going to attempt a live demo. Um, so these things have all been tried uh, and worked. Uh, I'm going to try GLX gears, and then if that works, I'm going to try Open Arena. So uh, where are we going? So this, so this is uh, this is a cheroot which has had the libgl surgically removed from it, and I'm going to try and launch GLX gears. You should see some spew from the capsule, which is where you can see it's mapped in the different uh, things, and we've got a GLX running, and you can see there it says, oh. DL open wrapper cannot pass RTLD global, so I know I'm intercepting these calls. Um, oops, lost it. Where's my pointer gone? Can someone see my pointer? Oh, there it is. So if we page up a bit, we can see I've got, this is the default namespace. You can see I've got some shim libraries mapped in here which are stubs, they don't contain any actual code, they're just a, a placeholder 
so that the linker can map things in and then I can scribble on the relocation records later. And then if I go up a bit, there we go. We can see there's a capsule there which has host libraries mapped in, which is where the real libraries reside. And these are isolated from the from GLX gears, except where I've redirected them with uh, relocation scribbling. So uh, that was one test. Now that's a relatively simple test because it has libgl linked in, not static linked in, but linked in. Uh, now S uh, Open Arena uses SDL, uh, which is going to DLMO DL open libgl, which is kind of a more complicated case because things are going to happen much later. If I'm really lucky, this will work. And uh, I've got about a 50% with this, with this demo. So let's see if we can get, get that percentage up a little higher. And oop, let's put the window here. Why is it put the window here? Uh, let me. I don't know if I can move the open arena window uh, up. Damn it, let's put it on the wrong screen. Uh, maybe I can just show, turn this around. Demos, they never work, right? OK, uh, it's tiny, but you should be able to see Open Arena actually running with I diverted libgl. Uh, OK, I think that's kind of the end of the talk. And So uh, the code is there. Uh, it's all kind of published already. Uh, this talk as well, if you're into that sort of thing, is available there. Um, any questions? Well, uh, I didn't understand then what makes the like your Open Arena demo only 50% reliable. Oh, uh, that was it was kind of unrelated to this. Um, it was a uh, Pulse Audio not being happy running in a Chirrut problem, which I eventually tracked down. But uh, yeah, it's like it's one of those things. It, it breaks, and quite often because there's a lot of moving parts. So uh, a colleague of mine. Uh, so this work was originally well, and still is sponsored by Valve um, because they want to improve game stability is one of the things. And so a colleague of mine, Simon Gitti, is working on the other side of this, which is assembling all of the right libraries within the runtime, sort of hybridizing your runtime libraries with the bits from the host that you need. Uh, you need to pick the newest libc of the ones that are available um, and a couple of other things. So he's working on that side of things, but those pieces don't exist yet. So I kind of had to hack it together by hand, which is why it was unreliable. So it wasn't anything intrinsic to the project. So I would like to ask if you have support for a t RT deep link to go to the next symbol in the chain. Sorry, to? To uh, support for deep linking when you load the symbol from the next library in the chain. Uh, no, I don't think we do. Um, this has pretty much just gotten to this stage, so not yet. Um, going in a different direction. Sure. Uh, could you use this to make um, symbols like soft linking where you, you resolve a function if the library is installed it uses the library and if it is not installed it just returns I don't know an, an error uh, yeah yeah um, what happens uh, when this one is uh, actually I didn't demo it because my auto generated stubs direct everything but um, yeah if you uh, you can have uh, what would happen there if a symbol wasn't available um, and you called it, you would immediately get a backtrace saying, you called a symbol that wasn't available in the target library. Here's the backtrace where you called it from here. So yes. Does that answer your question? Mm, yeah, but I, I don't want to get a backtrace. I want to, uh, you know, so for example, I have a program and the program links to five different compression libraries. Sure. And then if one of them is not installed, I would just want to say, no, cannot decompress this, you know, like try a different one or something like that. Yeah, yeah you could do that. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if you can speak a little about uh, what uh, Valve is planning to do longer term with this, where they're going. OK, sure. I mean, the idea is, is I mean, pretty much as I laid out at the beginning. So you know, you, you, you need libgl, or in the future, you'll need your, um, your Wayland drivers to come uh, 
Vulcan drivers, sorry, to come from the actual system because they're the thing that's closely tied to your hardware. And there's, there's no real sane way to put those, cram all the different ones into a runtime. You know, they would quite like a game that you bought 10 or whatever number of years ago to keep running even though you've, you're on a completely different system. So the idea is that the game will come tied to a runtime. Uh, a version, like pretty much similar to the way things like Flatpak work. You know, you've got your application in the runtime, you'll have a game, and it will specify, I want this flavor of runtime at this version. Um, but then you need to parachute in the most recent libc out of the two that's available, and you need to parachute in the graphics drive. The stuff that's tied to the hardware needs to be brought in from the host. Um, and so that's what it's going to be for. And the idea is that um, when uh, my colleague's work is done, all of that will sort of be assembled into your sort of hybrid runtime. Um, so hopefully we'll... The idea is that in the glorious flying car future, we will improve game stability a lot, right? If you have an old console, you can plug a game in that you bought X number of years ago and it will work. Now, they have the advantage that it's all baked into the hardware, so they don't really have to deal with things changing, but they would really like that to be the case, because what their thing is that they want to sell you stuff electronically, and they want you to have the confidence that whatever you've paid for, it goes on working. So that's the goal here. Sound, sounds great. Is there an ETA? Uh, there, there, there sort of is, but uh, it's tied to other things that I can't talk about, so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so what if there is a different system that uses the same hack, for example, a heat profiler that wants to replace all mallocs in, the, right. in your entire program? Uh, what, what if there is? Uh, the, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know what would happen. <laughs> it might work. It would depend on the order in which things happened. Um, is that, was that, were you saying, would they clash? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, can those interact? Is there a way to make it work? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to try it. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little about the surface area of GL that's relevant to change because I'm in my memory there's like a couple of APIs where you put a uh, uniform in and then you like hunk a giant string of program text and that goes across a terrifying barrier into the drivers. Okay. And then like, but that is like a function that says int and like gives you a void star and stuff, and right. so it doesn't really need um, much versioning. To, to be honest, I don't actually know that much about how GL worked. I mean, there was a possibility that I'd need to learn it to do this, but I kind of got to the point where it worked, and then I just stopped looking because, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as, as you may know, there's, there's a whole number of different ways of using libgl. There's the simple glx gears approach of just linking against it. There's the SDL approach of DL opening it and finding the functions. Um, there's the one where you get a specific function from GL, and then you ask it for the function pointers that you, that you want to call. But they all sort of work with this approach because it's only the small set of well-known functions that people can call that need to be proxied in this way, and everything else just kind of works, amazingly enough. Can, uh, for the um, dynamically linked GLX gears, can you just show what it looked like when you run uh, through LDD? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let's see here. Uh, nope. Where's the? That's right. I don't seem to be able to get focus back. Where's it gone? Oh right. Uh, sorry, giant screen. Let me quit that. Maybe that'll. Oh, there we go. So you can see libgl is going to a shim. Um, if we looked in that shim, we would just find stub functions with no actual code in them. Well, there's a little bit of code. There's code that generates a backtrace if you ever actually manage to call those functions. So the, the search path, the shim search path you added to the yes. containers LD yep. conf. Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. 
Yes. Um, so let me. Uh, nope, nope, it's going to work from here. Uh. Hello there. Oh, is, isn't it? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll make, make it public. I, you're the first person to actually ask, so... Uh, yeah. Okay, any other questions? I'm gonna make it show the LDD output again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw that you had... So why then here is... Uh, so you see like the fit, yeah, to the fit to last line there. Why is LDD saying that GLX gears, which you didn't have to recompile or anything, why is it dependent on libcapsule now? It's coming from the shim. The shim depends on libcapsule. So libcapsule is kind of, rather than I, baking the okay. code into every single shim, they link against libcapsule, which does that. Okay, uh, that seems to be all the questions. So uh, there it is, segregated dynamic linking.